Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore, and this is Reality Asserts Itself. We're continuing our series of interviews with Bob Moses, who was one of the most influential leaders of the civil rights movement. He's the founder of the Algebra Project. He was also one of the leaders of the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project, and Bob joins us again in the studio. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. So one more time, Bob is an educator, a civil rights activist during the 60s. He was a field secretary for SNCC. He also was an outspoken critic of the Vietnam War, and he's the founder of the Algebra Project, as I mentioned. He's also the author of Radical Equations, Civil Rights from Mississippi to the Algebra Project, and co-editor of Quality Education as a Constitutional Right, Creating a Grassroots Movement to Transform Public Schools. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. So we're going to pick up where we were. <coughs> uh, I asked you at the end of the last segment what you learned from the Hootenannies, and you talked about that there seemed to be a lynching every week in Florida. What else did you pick up in terms of the politics of that period and politics of the, of, of the milieu? There's a lot of talk about socialism. Uh, there's a lot of talk about, um, you know, a different way to have, you know, who has power and who owns stuff. Um, at the same time, there's tremendous pressure in the culture and the media against even talking about that kind of stuff. As you mentioned, McCarthyism, you know, it's considered un-American to even discuss such things. Yeah. You're old enough to start understanding all this. Yeah, but I'm not really attracted to uh, politics as I see it around me in Harlem um, or really to a kind of, um, the kind of talk that young people would do who um, were part of that, you know, sort of environment. Um, I'm really focused, I'm busy, right? So Stuyvesant um, is, my last two years at Stuyvesant, uh, we're in a morning session. So school goes from eight to 12. It takes me an hour to get to school, I have a job, right? So. Um, I leave uh, school, I'm working at NYU Medical Library. Um, and then I'm playing basketball at the Harlem Y, right? So three nights a week. And if I'd asked you right. then what you think you'd be doing five or ten years later, what would have been your answer? Uh, well, so I'm a kid who hasn't uh, thought much about career. Right. So when I get to college and I'm majoring in philosophy, everybody's asking me, you know, what are you going to do with philosophy, right? Uh, and I'm not caring. But you got, a, you got an uncle is. who's a rising officer in the military. You got another uncle who's an architect. Did you think you were heading towards some kind of professional career? No, no, I actually didn't think. And the uncle who was the, you know. We weren't, I wasn't really looking at uh, my uncles as role models. Um, um, and there wasn't any pressure in my family, uh, you know, to, towards career. Um, and so, um, so I'm a kid who decides that um, I'm going to study philosophy and I really don't care. Um, people are asking me, what are you going to do with philosophy, right? And so I have no idea, but I'm interested in it. Well, if you're not that interested in the politics at the time, where do you get, when do the coin starts dropping for you that you're going to start committing yourself to the civil rights movement? The sit-ins. Right. When, so when, when, when was pictures, that, what happened? Um, when those pictures start appearing in uh, 1960, Right, um, in February, March, right, 1960, um, I'm watching the young people sit in uh, through the lens of the New York Times. This is the first time that young black men and women are on the front page of the New York Times. Tell us the story. Talking to the, of the, the nation um, about what I feel inside now, right, right? Because I've now gone through Hamilton. Um, Hamilton has is a fraternity school, right? Um, uh, when I get there, there are three blacks in a, a small school, 525 students, right? Um, at most, three black students. It's um, the guy who interviews me says, you know we're a fraternity school. I say, yes. 
Um, and basically that means you know that you cannot join any of these fraternities, right? Um, so um, I make a trade-off about the school I want to go to. Uh, I, I don't want to go down south um, and into the segregated, you know, south. Um, um, and I want to go to a small school where I can play ball, right? So I play basketball through college. Um, and I want a good education, right? So I make a trade-off, um, and I actually get funded. I get a full scholarship to go to this school, right? And so, so that's what happens. Um, I go to Hamilton, and then I go um, leave Hamilton, go to Harvard, right? Um, again, Harvard in the 1950s, you know, it, blacks are scarcer than hen's teeth, right? So I'm the only black in the philosophy department in the graduate school at, at Harvard. Um, I think that I'm going to Harvard so that I can really test how I stand. I'm really disappointed when uh, my roommate tells me that the professor uh, tells him that he's um, uh, not really, um, he doesn't say afraid, but he's, he's uneasy about calling on me, right? So, I d so what it means is I don't escape this but, but issue of some objective, you know. Har Harvard, Harvard, one of Harvard's role, at least, is to train people to join the ruling elite and become those who can help rule one way or the other. Um, you, you know, we, we've seen it more, I mean, in a more I, modern I, sense. We see Barack Obama winds up president. I mean, there's a, somewhere. I'm not thinking about that. I'm, no, I'm thinking, saying you are, but yeah. Harvard as an institution yeah. is right. certainly one of the things it does. And I know that. I mean, so par part of who's going to Harvard? Well, black people are going to Harvard who are part of the black elite, right? And I know about them because I know about them through my cousins, right? Um, because through their uh, family circumstances, they are part of the black elite, right? And they're sending their kids to private schools and then on to Ivy League schools. Um, but my part of family is not that at all. We're not, we're not doing that. Um, so I know about it, but I'm not part of it. So tell us the story of the sit-ins and then what effect that had on you. So um, what I did when I saw the sit-ins, this is um, the black students at the uh, HBCUs, the historically black universities, have decided that um, they've had enough, right? And so they began sitting in at Woolworths and the Five and Dime stores at the lunch counter. This is right across the country? Um, across the Mid-South, right? So it's uh, Atlanta, um, which is not the Mid-South, but Atlanta is a big city in the Mid-South, right? But um, Tennessee, North Carolina, right, Kentucky, right, um, and some in South Carolina, Orangeburg, South Carolina, right? So um, something's up, right? But, and what I, um, what I see watching their faces is uh, I see them looking like I'm feeling inside, right, based on Stuyvesant, Hamilton, Harvard, right? And this is a time when young black students could not eat at the lunch counter at Woolworths. Or well, the South is still, you know, it's the apartheid of the South. I mean, the South really is um, just running an apartheid system uh, around Jim Crow. Um, uh, you know uh, Blackman's book, Slavery by Another Name. Um, so um, Doug Blackman, um, he really names this era because um, we're really talking about the era from roughly after 1875 when uh, the Democrats, by really terror and violence, overthrow the state legislature in Mississippi, and William Alexander Percy, who is this plantation owner from Greenville, goes into the Mississippi legislature to oversee the articles of impeachment against Adelbert Ames, who is um, the governor that has been elected by black votes of Mississippi. Uh, 
and he's the respectable face of this terror, right? Uh, and so uh, from that era right down to the uh, Civil Rights Movement, um, I think he names it. It's slavery by another name. Um, Francis Biddle is, is amazing. He's, he's the Attorney General under Roosevelt. In 1941, December 12th, um, he issues Circular 3951 he, uh, to every state Attorney General and says that from now on you should prosecute um, peonage not as indebtedness but prosecuted as involuntary servitude and slavery, right? So what Blackman does is he investigates as a Wall Street Journal reporter. He asks a really uh, amazing, interesting question. He says, what if we looked at American corporations vis-a-vis -vis the industrialization and the use of black labor in this country in the same way as we looked at German corporations vis-a-vis -vis the Holocaust, right? And he writes an article on the front page of the Wall Street Journal about this and gets an amazing response from all over the country, people who are writing him about relatives, right, that got caught up in this involuntary servitude, slavery, of the founding of the steel industry right, in this country, right? And so then he goes off and does this investigation uncovering tens of thousands of black young men who are conscripted on vagrancy and sent into the, the mines, right, in Birmingham, right? So um, one way of thinking about um, what was happening with the students, right, um, the, in 1960, I didn't understand it then, but they are actually breaking, right, this uh, sort of era, right, um, of slavery by another name, which happens after the Civil War and after Reconstruction is ended. And it ends in Mississippi in 1875 with the, when the Democrats take over by terror and violence. So you got another almost three quarters of a century. We're going to continue this discussion with Bob Moses on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. Please join us. Mm -hmm.